Welcome and good morning. We meet here with a special interview edition of News Click and Communism Combat, meeting with Ms. Aisha Kidwai, the president of JNUTA, the Teachers Association at Jawaharlal Nehru University. One year after the agitation in Jawaharlal Nehru University broke out last February, once again the university in the midst of a turmoil with teachers and students both agitation against agitating against the high-handed moves of the executive under the current MHRD in trying to cut seats, change admission procedures, etc. Thank you, Aisha ji, for talking to us. I'd just like to ask you, today is 23rd of March 2017. Last February, we saw the entire JNU campus being sieged in a way by the police and under the central government. Where have we come one from you and what is the present state of the recent agitation? One must understand that JNU, unlike most other central universities, for its size, is primarily a research university. 67% of our students are research students. They hail from all corners of India. About 60% are women. And about 60 to 65% come from economically backward or socially deprived or um, categories. So this is a very unique space where the focus is not skills, right, but the production of knowledge. Whereas the enrollment, if you look nationwide, uh, of research students in all universities is 0.5%, according to an MHRD survey from 2014. And in central universities, it's 3.5%. We have 67.5%. We also happen, by some external metrics, which we do not take all that seriously, that we are the best ranked university, full-fledged university in the country, we just got the visitors award. Because for us, a university space is actually not only determined by outputs and API points, but the fact that this is a teaching and learning environment. Now, when you have a high-performing university, which people would say well, intellectually elite, maybe you can even call it, um, but it is not socially elite. Uh, can the, can the UGC make a set of regulations whose intention is to decrease MPhil PhD enrollment? So let me intervene here just for a minute. That's the next question I wanted to ask, that you have an act under which the JNU was formed, which yes. is a statutory, which is a law, the statutory law. Now you're seeing executive high-handedness through a May 2016 UGC notification, trying to overturn, uh, overturn a law which is, exists. You have an academic council which says 1,048 seats for yes. MPhil and PhD, and you have the uh, administration saying only 130. So yes. the logger, it, it is actually an illegal way of countermanding the act under which the university was formed. Absolutely. absolutely. So how how is this possible that the government does this? Well, you see, this is uh, what is happening to us now in the future that faces India. That to use the instruments of the courts, executive orders. Uh, ordinances to actually repeal the legislations that have been enacted by parliament. After much and debate and after much movement, mass and movement. So even the UGC does not say that you don't, your law act does not exist. In fact, through these regulations it says that uh, accepted or uh, determined by academic bodies, it even mentioned the name of academic council. But when these regulations were placed, they were placed um, and immediately in the 141st academic council meeting, teachers said, I'm sorry, this is, and you know, these are not in conformity, let's write to the UGC and say that we've done this in the past, in 2009, we've been able to make a successful case, that don't, we are adopting as much as we can. However, this time minutes were falsified, academic council meeting was actually railroaded, a majority of academic council members made protests, and these were imposed upon us. Since then, we have been asking GCC. Some students of JNU even went to the court. We said we are not asking the court to rule on the validity of the UGC regulation. We are asking the court to tell the university that it must respect its own statute. Even if we have to plagiarize the UGC guidelines, the vice chancellor is not the person who can do so. But instead of listening to, heeding to us, our friends, the court gave a judgment which we do not accept, which we are in the which the students are in the process of appealing against, which ruled on the validity of the UGC guidelines, something a prayer that was not before the court at all. And one reason why this could have happened is because, you know, 
earlier universities, even if administrations were corrupt and you know, uh, political appointees, the, you could not as a university resign from your own act. This time in court, the university gave one written affidavit which upheld the act, but its oral arguments were made by the additional solicitor general of India. And after a small little case of a matter of 1,000 students, I cannot believe that the additional solicitor general of India should have so much time and who should come. And so what, what do you feel is the game plan? And GNU is obviously making a first target. So what is the wider game plan in terms so of The wider game plan is to use the UGC as a means not only to determine what is to be, uh, what when you can give a degree, but to determine what is taught. To actually foreclose every space of so we will perhaps get instructions about which parts of the Sanskrit canon we can teach. This is actually happening across the country, even in, uh, not only in UGC, it's also from what I understand happening with NCRT, CBSC, but I'm not sure about this. But I'll tell you, one other thing that happened is that there, for, in the 11th plan, these centers for the study of discrimination and exclusion have also been closed down. Were closed down, but now the UGC says the letter is a forgery. JNU says the letter is a forgery. That there was a committee, I'm hearing today that there was a committee meeting. Right? They actually wanted to close them down, but the tragic demise of a uh, Dalit student in jail. And that's what I want to come to. It's, you know, a particular incident um, has, of course, terrible ramifications. But actually, this move, where now we have some about 1,500 MA students, many of them want to come back to jail. Many of them, the only place that they can afford to even dream to do a PhD is JNU because our fees is 220 rupees for six months. Because we have been able to use our act to argue that this is the responsible state to have such low fees. It's still not cheap to live in Delhi, but you research students get a non debt fellowship. All other universities in the country have implemented these guidelines because they do not have a body of research students already who will protect. Can you just explain to the viewer what this composition and how it impacts on the underprivileged, what we call as Dalit backward minority students and, and how their entry is so vital to be able to have a more uh, representative student makeup? I would make it on two points. It's not only about social justice, it's also about the production of knowledge. That is that diversity is necessary to ask you questions and to provide you answers, to deepen understanding in every field. Okay. So the way that um, right now you, we have state mandated reservation, which uh, is 27.5 OBP, 15% uh, uh, SC, and 67.5 uh, um, uh, SC. And also there is a 3%, I think, for uh, persons with disabilities. Now, every university is supposed to have that. And uh, these people, I mean, these seats are a percentage of a total number. Okay, okay. Right? So, if my total number is just one, then at the most, there's going to be one more reserve candidate. Right? Okay, and then there will have to be universities also gone up to see who gets it. Okay. Now, in Daniel, we don't only do that. We don't only do reservation. We have a system which has been there from the really almost since the birth of JNU, was discontinued for eight, nine years, a system of deprivation points. And this follows from the first schedule of our act, which says that we are required to provide education to the poorest of the poor in India from all corners of India. This system of deprivation points are, can go up to an excess of 12 marks over and this is given to if you are a person who is from a backward region as defined by the quartile system of India. If you have been to, if you've done your schooling in a government school with the fees last paid, then you get more points. If you are an SC woman, you can SC woman from a backward area with the, you can get up to 12 marks extra. Which means that people... So it's like who, a, actually measuring a social handicap, you know, actually. Yes. Yeah. And the reason why we do it is, of course, we like, you know, the social justice is clear to our heart. 
But how will there be new questions also? You can do it, it's important for science, it's important for uh, social science, it's important for humanities. And why DNU has been at the top for decades now is because students like this ask these questions and they and do the research. Why research in DNU is meaningful. It's meaningful for students, it's meaningful for society, it's meaningful and held in very high esteem internationally. Uh, now a political question that we see that this kind of creeping up of uh, privatization of higher education has not happened overnight. Even the earlier UPA1 and UPA2 governments were trying to do this, they introduced the semester system in DU, they tried to do all this. But the particular edge that this government has brought to the attack on JNU, how would you differentiate between the earlier attack, which is a general attack on private education, which is now added to with an ideological sung kind of an attack? You see, I think you have to draw an ideology, it's like an ideological basket that you have to address to. It's not only profession. So first of all, it's very easy to distinguish between what has happened in the past and now. There were no rules made specifically, specifically for JNU. There was no selective implementation. But the attack on JNU is, I think, for a number of reasons and draws one from the stand, which is a very strong stand in the BJP and the RSS, which is an anti-reservation stand. I mean, it is no accident that periodically every three or four months, somebody or the other in the RSS says reservation is back. It is um, not any surprise that Hartik Patel and the Jats, who are dominant group, in, uh, are now demanding reservation. Their slogan is reservation for us or not at all. Right? And it's the not at all which is being implemented because the dominant group, numerically dominant, politically dominant, yeah, they will hog up the reservation. There's one strand of that. And JNU is, aside from its left and democratic culture, it's the one place where reservation social inclusion, right, at least has had an impact on university figures beyond that 22.5%. Right? So that this is not a system that you want to encourage. Particularly because it is also world class because of this, not despite it. So there's this one strand, then there is a deep communal agenda. Because if you look at the attacks that what has happened in uh, we a, a student, a Muslim student in Fraka, uh, alleged Fraka, was then beaten up and has now disappeared off the face of it. Since October 28th, and we don't know where he is. Yes. And nobody is asking, and except and his mother. You know, despite huge numbers of protests, despite the big key, he has not been found. So you have faced in an atmosphere which was, this campus has been always an ocean of security for everybody who lives here. One line, uh, Professor Kidwai, to end this interview with, what would you like to say? One last thought. My last thought is that I think that as a, you know, people, we really have to understand that just freedom of speech and expression is not the way to fight. No, we can't say Azadi, but we have to reclaim this discourse of rights. And that discourse is not limited just to freedom of speech and expression. So I think it's important for all of us to realize that the battle in JNU, within JNU, being fought so bravely by the teachers and students is not a battle of that campus but a battle that all Indians should understand is critical for the production of fair and just knowledge for the future. Thank you so much, Professor Kidwai, for this time. Thank you. Thank you.